It is here, y'all. The DC20 0.6 Alpha release is live right now. Super awesome. Three brand new classes, four brand new spells, including Find Familiar and Shield. Ancestry updates a brand new Ancestry of the Beast Born, which is any sort of beast you could possibly think of with the DC20 Ancestry system. It really brings that whole thing to life, literally. And with the Kickstarter getting closer and closer, I'm taking the alpha and I'm cutting the whole price of the thing in half. So we are adding more content and the biggest update ever in 0.6, more stuff and less price. I wanna get as many people involved with this as possible and let me get a little taste of DC20 before the launch of the Kickstarter, but we'll talk about all that kind of stuff in just a minute. Ooh, so if you don't know, I'm the dungeon coach creator of DC20 and this is the overview video of some of the big key features of the 0.6 release. Three new spell classes that you know and love, but with a little bit of upgrade to some DC 20 flair in there of the Bard, Druid, and Warlock. We're adding another ancestry called the Beastborn, which lets you be any sort of anthropomorphic beast creature you can think of. This is where an elephant born would come from, frog born like Grung that you're used to in D&D. Lizard folk, which you could actually make into a chameleon folk, a spider folk, so many different things, so many different traits to get into. Oh. Four new spells, including shield, which is very much needed for some defensive uses for the cat Masters you can pick up now, and the Find Familiar spell, which is just so much fun and so much customization you can do with that thing. And then on the rules front, there's a ton of new rules that have been updated and polished off and tweaked and changed because I'm constantly listening to you guys' feedback and constantly adjusting. I'm not thinking inside that box too much to get locked in and set in on certain types of things. I'm constantly thinking of what if could things be better, which has led the game to the best state it's ever been in. There's an entire attribute overhaul, truly fixing and balancing out a lot of these attributes. I have full videos on those down in the description. I am going to touch on them in this video, but I dive into them in the others. We got quality of life changes at level one, maneuver and technique updates for the marshals, and the dynamic attack save has been polished off. So in this video, we're going over the big picture of some of the big hot ticket items here on this whole update list. And then I do have another video over on the brand new DC20 official YouTube channel. I just launched it. This technically last week was its first video that I posted of the little welcome intro. This channel is going to be still what it always is, making content to be able to help dungeon masters, help you be able to play DC20 better, help you be able to game master better in general. All that stuff is still gonna be the same, but the DC20 channel is gonna be the more logistical channel, news updates about DC20, and I can post those things without worrying about the algorithm. So check out that channel, subscribe to it, all that good stuff, see what that's going on, and stay tuned for more stuff coming from there. But if you want to dive into every single change in the change log, I do have a video over there. And I want to give a shout out to a DC20 content creator. Those are coming out more and more these days, but it's called Swordplay and Sorcery. He has a YouTube channel where he makes a whole bunch of different videos about D&D, other tabletop roleplay games, and DC20. He's a true friend of the community, but he just made a video about showing and introducing DC20, the concept of it, to a brand new person who's never heard of it before. I did a similar video of what is DC20, but man, he did it in five minutes and he did it better than I did. So I'm gonna put that video link down in the description as well. Show him some love, subscribe to his channel, all that kind of stuff. It really does help him, especially newer growing channels. And share that video with some friends who are interested in knowing, hey, what's this whole DC20 thing about? And the last thing before we dive into this update is if you wanna pick this up for yourself, listen to all these changes, see if you're interested in them or maybe you've been on the fence before. The DC20 Alpha has always been a paid early access product for the simple reason that I needed to do that to be able to get to the finish line of the Kickstarter, which isn't really a finish line. It's kind of the start of the whole thing. But I was running out of the ability to do that and I had to do that to, to get there. And I'm still, even as we're getting close to the Kickstarter, needing to do the Kickstarter to make sure that we can actually finish this thing through. So as we're getting closer, I've lowered it from 15 down to 10. And there's also a coupon code that you can get down linked in the description, sign up and you get text messaged a coupon code for $5 off. So you can actually pick this thing up now for five bucks. Over 150 pages of a fully playable TTRPG with 14 classes and a whole bunch more. Five bucks, there you go. And the support now is gonna help us make this Kickstarter as big as humanly possible to turn this thing truly into something next level. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get into this update. First thing I gotta talk about are the three classes. I have fallen in love with these three classes. They are so freaking cool, could do entire videos on them, but we have the Bard. The Bard, the DC20 version of the Bard, has something called a musical performance. They can start a performance, whether that be playing a, a musical instrument, playing a flute, singing a song, telling a story, starting to dance, and they can do this performance, and this performance gives has an aura of buffs that it gives to their party members, and they can change the song, they can change the buff that they give dynamically as the battle happens. They, of course, have buffs to their help action, and they can actually give the help action as a reaction, and they're the only class that can do this, 
and they're able to better help their allies, and this is the version of Bardic Inspiration. But in DC20, we don't have to gate Bardic Inspiration behind a limited of two uses. You can only do it, and then you can't be a bard anymore. No, no, no. You're just better at doing the help action. And then we have the Druid, which I love so much. Druids are all about nature and animals, right? So the first feature they get at level one is called Druid's Grove. They're able to create pockets of a grove in spaces on the battlefield that they can choose that you can make it a wall, you can make it a patch, however you want to make it. But within your grove, you have certain benefits that you have. You can heal allies within your grove. You can use the vines there to grab onto enemies. You can move objects around within your grove and you can create a grove around you. And of course, the second feature is wild form. You have a true form, which is yourself, and you can shape shift into a wild form. And this wild form is the most customizable thing ever. How it basically works is you have a certain amount of points that you get whenever you shape shift, and you can choose from a list of beast traits. And those traits let you be able to create whatever type of animal you want. Do you want to be a panther that's faster with a climb speed? Go for it. Or do you want to make a panther that's more stealthy and more can hide in the dark? Maybe you want to be a big bear with a whole bunch of health or whatever type of creature you want. You can truly make it in your druid. So I will say the druid is a bit more of an advanced class in the, in the big picture of the, all the comparison to the other classes. It is more advanced because being able to create a grove with all these things you can do and be able to shift into animals with a bunch of options has a lot of options. But I think that's good and I didn't want to restrict the design space to the druid and make it too simple or basic and it's just, it's I think it's in a great spot right now. So then the last spellcaster is a warlock. But the warlock, how do I make a warlock? All these different spellcasters in DC 20 have a goal of feeling different from every other spellcaster. So what's the deal with the warlock. They've made a pact with some sort of higher power, whether it be good or evil, that's up to you to decide. But this pact ties your body to this entity, ties your soul to this entity. So you are able to tap into that aspect of your health and soul and use your health to boost your magic. That's right, you can spend health to amplify and upcast spells in certain ways. You can give yourself advantage on certain things you can doing by spending your own health. Don't worry, at higher levels you have a drain life type of abilities to be able to take take health back from others to have like a circle of life type playstyle where you are hurting yourself to do more and then hurting others to refuel. And at level one, you're able to choose one of four packs that you can make. So yes, the subclass still comes online at third level, but you do still pick a pack which gives you a packed weapon to be able to use and wield to summon in your hand or even packed armor to summon around yourself to be a bit more defensive of a warlock, be a bit more survivable. Packed cantrip allows you to kind of amplify the cantrips that you can cast to become even better at casting those cantrips, and then there's Pact Familiar, of course, to give you a little minion. All three of these are so cool, and I can't wait for y'all to get in and play them. And then the second thing is the Ancestry. The Beastborn Ancestry is, again, the biggest ancestry of all the ancestries. All other ancestries have a default amount of traits that you can choose to just have five default traits or an expanded set of traits. Beastborn, there's no default for this because it's just a wide category of frog person, turtle person, bear person, tiger person, whatever you want to do. Uh, and there's a ton of mobility traits. There's a ton of beast traits, really. And they're separated into categories to keep them nice and organized for yourself. And you can go and spend and create whatever type of beast you want to be. Beast traits also have the ability for you to gain a natural weapon. Now, this natural weapon, you can manifest it in whatever way you want. It can be a scorpion tail. It can be giant badger claws. It could be a huge beak that you poke people with. Whatever you want. The amount of customization with the beast born is insane. So again, the beast born is a bit of an advanced ancestry for players to choose. So a brand new players probably shouldn't choose Beastborn, or if they did, a brand new beginner player wanted to be like, oh, I want to be an elephant person. Cool. Then maybe the dungeon master can go in and help them out and kind of pick some traits here and there. Ooh, make it, okay, you're large. There's even a trait of a prehensile appendage, which in this case would be a trunk. <laughs> you can see I just get so excited about the, the possibilities are endless. And then I already referenced the new spells. You have shield, which is important. It's basically a reaction that the spellcasters can take to be able to defend themselves or an ally around them. Gaining kind of a bit of the marshals. If you're familiar with Perry from Marshalls, Shield is kind of like a cantrip version of that. There's also a design goal in DC 20 currently, which will be iterated on if in future versions of as reactions to spellcasters, spellcasters having more reaction type things they can do. This is one example of that. Then there's Find Familiar, which we've already talked about, and it's similar to Wild Form for Druids, where you shapeshift into a form and you can pick some traits to be able to have the form you shapeshift into. Same with Familiar, you summon a Familiar and there's a list of traits that you can pick for your Familiar. Two new spells come along with the Druid in the form of Druid Craft and Tethering Vines, which is DC20's version of Entangle. I'll go over the full how those spells work in the uh, video on the DC20 channel. But that's all the spells and that's all the ancestries and classes. So now to the rules. Attribute Overhaul. I have a whole video, the link in the description of the Attribute Overhaul that goes over each thing and the uh, agility slash armor
armor update uh, that just also happened. I have that video down there as well for how kind of what the attributes and, and armor is kind of looking like. But stay tuned for 0.7 because there is an armor update coming with there and a couple of things having to do with physical defense, mental defense and its applications towards heavy and light armor and things like that. That's coming in 0.7, so don't worry. But the overview of it, basically, if you don't want to watch those, is Might now is the only thing that gives you bonus health instead of Agility. Agility no longer gives bonus health. Might is the only one, the strong strongness of your body. But then Agility also has all the stuff it normally did before, but it also now is, is the main determinant of physical defense. So whether you're unarmored, light armor, heavy armor, whatever, you always are adding agility to your physical defense. Intelligence now gives bonus skills. So if you have an intelligence of two, you gain two bonus skill points to spend on those skills. Charisma now has a use in combat in the form of grit points. There's also some things that are being worked on with grit points, but this is the first version of it that I want you to be able to play test, have some fun with, see what you feel about it. And I'm really looking for some feedback on that because uh, I'm really excited about it. From the play test that I've started to do with it and the general concept really excites me, but basically, Charisma never can apply towards combat. It never really has. This is the version of the force of will, your own force of will and applying that force of will and your charisma to inspire and help others. Charisma gives grit points. So if you have a charisma of two, you get two grit points and you can spend these grit points to give yourself advantage on a save or give an ally that you can see or hear advantage on a save. Lots of really cool role play moments, lots of really cool stuff that, that's going on there. But those that's the big picture. So now in combat specifically, because again, attributes across the whole big picture of the game feel really great they feel perfect across the whole section of the game but in combat i wanted them to all at least be relevant in some way so basically might is health agility is physical defense intelligence or more skills and charisma is grit points over on the mastery front now another update is points skill points trade points and language points it is a much easier smooth conversion between the two of them now you can spend a skill point on a trade that's something that used to not be possible but if you have a skill point you really want to pick up blacksmithing for whatever reason sure you can totally do that you can you can trade those out and convert them over for a one-to-one -one. but then it gets better trade points can be spent on language skills so language points and trade points they used to be this kind of the same resource or something clunky now a trade point can be converted into two language points and now you can spend those points on languages and learn your languages and all that stuff which brings me to languages and another update is languages used to have three levels of mastery in language you either didn't know the language we'll use dwarvish for example you either did not know dwarvish you had a small amount of dwarvish where you kind of could understand it another level of kind of understand it and then fluency that was just a bit too many levels, so now it has gotten down to just two levels of language which i think is much more clean it's you either don't know the language you kind of know it, which now introduces a cool new mechanic called a language check. So you're reading something in a foreign script, but you don't have full mastery in that language. You're not fluent in the language, which a lot of us can relate to, for me, Spanish. I can kind of know a little bit here because I, I was a teacher and other things. I can pick up some stuff, but I'm definitely not fluent. So that can be represented now within a game. It's kind of cool. You read a script and you pick up a few words, make a language check. Somebody says something and you're listening to it. Oh, wait, what did they say? Make a language check, which gives you a little bit of gray area there which is kind of cool. And then there's obviously fluency, but now only having two levels of mastery makes it a lot smoother. And the fact that a trade point can convert into two language points, basically again, you can get fluency in a language for one trade point and it works out really beautifully. Now for the category of checks and saves. Um, a lot of language has been really cleaned up when it comes to attacking. There's been attack checks and spell checks. And when you make an attack that targets physical defense and attack that targets mental defense, all these different things, some spell checks target defense and some spell checks are just a healing spell so there's a lot of clean the entire document has been cleaned up with language towards attacking an attack is now codified as something that targets defense that's as simple as that if it's a firebolt coming at your physical defense and you get hit by it if it's a mental attack targeting your mental defense it's you're getting attacked someone's trying to deal damage to you they're targeting your defense it's called an attack so now it's very very simple if a feature says something something about when you're attacked it's very clean. It's, instead of having to say, oh, an attack check or a spell check, the tar it's just uh, uh, across the board, across the entire document, as far as words and clearness has been a big upgrade for lots of categories. Speaking of attacks, we have dynamic attack saves as another upgrade here. Dynamic attack saves used to be where you make an attack against their defense, kind of like we just said. I am shooting a fire bolt at you. So I am uh, making an, a, a spell check of some kind that's going to be targeted against your defense. And the old version of this would be you would make a save, assuming there's 
some sort of burning condition, some sort of effect that's added onto this fireball that's coming at you, right? And you had to make a save of some kind to not be burning or to be caught on fire, right? The damage component is in the attack and the effect was the save you make, right? So used to be you would save against the target's uh, save DC. <laughs> that a lot of it feels bad and it felt like this, it wasn't as intuitive. It, it's, it did slow things down a little bit because talking about it was like, oh, uh, what did you get? Oh, what did I? Okay, well, I'm applying, what's the number I have to beat? Oh, what's the number I have to beat? It got a little clunky. So a much smoother version now. Also, side note, the save DC is a little bit low. So people would save a lot on the making a save. You would probably have a higher chance of saving against such a low DC in general. But now dynamic attack saves is I make that fireball. I make that spell check. I put whatever I want into it and I shoot that firebolt at them and they make a save, right? I'm still targeting their defense. I'm hitting their defense and I deal damage plus five for every, you know, or plus one for every five over their defense. That's still true, but they make a save against my check. So it's like a contest as, as well. And so I'm not only attacking their defense with this number. So let's say I roll and I get an 18. I'd be like 18 to hit. And now that I've said 18 to hit, they know how much damage I deal. And then they now also know what save they have to beat. It's so much more smooth, so much more quick and intuitive. I absolutely love this change. So now where does a save DC come in? Save DCs are still a thing in the game, but they're only really for like repeated saves where if you have some sort of magical effect on somebody, and they have to continuously make a save against that effect, yeah. Or if I were to be a ranger or something and go set a trap somewhere and leave it, that would be triggered by and they would be against my save DC. Anything that are like passive stuff or repeated stuff. Now for damage, specifically resistance and vulnerabilities, there's been a clean a cleanup of the vocabulary in this because uh, in before there was resist and resistance and vulnerable and vulnerability. And those words meant different things because one was resist, fire resist one would reduce the damage you take of fire by one. So if you took five damage, you would instead take four and it's just a subtraction thing, right? Um, and then resistance, like we're used to in D&D, &D, would be having things, right? Now, those have been combined together in a much cleaner visual way and it's way more intuitive. So if I showed you this and it says fire resistance one in a parentheses, right? That means every time you take fire damage, you reduce the amount of fire damage you take by that number in the parentheses, which is one. So if you had fire resistance three, then you would reduce all fire damage every time you take it by three. And then now see if you can figure out what this one means. Fire resistance half. That is actual resistance, right? So now it's way simpler. You just say half. You just say what's in there. And then there's also fire resistance immune, which is immunity, right? And it's a much more. And the same thing happens for vulnerability. You can say the different numbers and different types and how much you're affected by this thing. I think it's pretty clean and it looks really nice as far as in monster stat blocks and abilities and all that kind of stuff. It just really makes it very clear what the thing is. And we can also talk about resistance. Like if you have any fire resistance, you don't have to make saves for exhaustion in the desert or whatever. Next up, we have maneuvers, which had a big update. There used to be three categories of maneuvers. We had attack maneuvers, which was like doing things with your weapon. And then we had uh, defensive maneuvers, which is defensively doing things to protect people and then grapple maneuvers, right? The, the more niche kind of grappling type stuff. There's been a big update. So the, the maneuvers now work like this. There are attack maneuvers. These maneuvers are automatically given to all martial characters. All marshals get all attack maneuvers. These are the simple offensive strikes you could make with any weapon, very simple. Everyone would learn this as a marshal get being used to a weapon. Spellcasters don't have access to these because they're not marshals. That's always been the case. But the attack maneuvers now are the three basic ones, which you, if you know the system well enough, you might guess which ones they are, which is the power attack, adding one damage, extend attack, which is a reach, a little bit of one space of reach, and the sweep attack, which is that cleave ability. Those are now called attack maneuvers. And then there's a new category of maneuvers called save maneuvers. Save maneuvers make your target make a save, which is why they're called save maneuvers. The target makes a physical save against being prone or knocked back or shoved or or slowed or whatever it is, right? That's now, oh, also side note there, the prone, the trip attack, the trip maneuver is now two action points because prone is much stronger than the other conditions. So uh, that was the wildly stronger uh, version of maneuver. So the save maneuver that applies prone costs two action points instead of one. Every other action, every other maneuver costs one, but we need to tune that one up. And the defensive maneuvers and grapple maneuvers are all the same. So those four categories, attack maneuvers, everybody gets, save maneuvers, 
defensive maneuvers and grapple maneuvers. Then how it works now though, is just like casters have a certain amount of cantrips known and spells known, marshals have a certain amount of maneuvers known and techniques known. So yes, that means now marshals do not gain access to every single maneuver in the game, which there was like 13 or 14, 15 maneuvers, not counting weapon maneuvers. It was overwhelming how many maneuvers marshals had access to. And especially for a brand new player, a level one first time player, Whew, wow, that was too much. And to kind of talk at the same time about this, techniques. Techniques are no longer available at level one. They've been moved to gaining access to them at level two. So what this looks like now for a brand new player, instead of having to have every access to every single maneuver in the game and have to choose from a list of techniques to be able to choose from that you can now have, and then that's a lot. And I did not want, it was too much. It was never the design for it to be that much, especially out the gate. Because if somebody's playing the game for the first time, I don't want them to play a martial and be overwhelmed. I do want that to be a more simple experience than a spellcaster. I think that is important. So now a brand new player picks four maneuvers, and they're ready to go. But keep in mind, you gain all access, you already get all attack maneuvers and you have all weapon maneuvers. You already have all of those. So that is a lot of maneuvers. Now, the weapon maneuver based is on what you're wielding, right? You only have access to the sword maneuver with a sword, right? But as a marshal, you gain all weapon maneuvers, all three of the attack maneuvers, and then you get to pick four between the other ones. So you still have a lot of options, still have a lot of customizability, but I think it feels a lot better during character creation to create that one and your choice matters. Which maneuver do you want? Which ones are you going to pick up? All that kind of stuff. And then as far as techniques are concerned, now every even level at levels two, four, six, eight, ten, you gain plus one stamina, plus one maneuver, and plus one technique. So at level two now, your stamina gets up by one, you gain another maneuver, which goes from four to five, and you gain a technique for the first time now. And now the progression of what your character is capable of can now grow as you gain access to techniques. Real quick weapon update here for the crossbow. Crossbows were overperforming, especially in comparison to bows. They did a lot of damage. You do have to reload them. You have to spend an action point to reload them. That is true. But in the big picture of things, the, the 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 math was still not working out for them. They were still overperforming just by a little bit. So here's what happened with crossbows. And they got a little bit of a rework as far as their, their uh, maneuvers and passives and stuff. So all crossbows now across the board, their damage has been reduced by one, but they've been given the impact property. And if you're familiar with this, this is what happened to heavy weapons in the 0.5 update. Impact property just means on a heavy hit or higher, you deal plus one damage. So they technically still deal the same damage on a heavy hit or higher, but on regular normal hits, their damage is one less than usual, is kind of how it works out to be. And uh, a great quality of life improvement for the crossbow is their passive and their maneuver. The crossbow maneuver now is you spend one action point to gain advantage and plus one damage on your attack, which is very much crossbow indicative of uh, being able to really put a lot into your shot, making every shot count, which is all about the crossbow play style compared to a bow, which compared to the bow can fire a lot more shots. So crossbow maneuver really makes every shot count advantage and plus one damage which actually helps play into the whole crossbows all about one shot making it really count compared to the bow that can fire more and the crossbows passive is another quality of life thing based around reloading is now whenever a crossbow reloads you get two spaces of movement for free so you have a little bit of a tactical reload now where you reload and move two spaces i'll say this i have a dc20 campaign that started and we are playing now we're in session three we're on a moving and one of the my, my rogue uses a cross not my rogue one of the players is a rogue that uses a crossbow and how oh, it feels great. If you want to check out those live plays of me playing with my home game, I film every single session. It's available to patrons at the most entry level. You can also join Patreon for free and then gain access to the link and be able to see it and go all, all, all that stuff and technically have it for free as well or stay in support with this whole thing we're doing here. Anyway, down the home stretch now, I have absolutely updated and overhauled the character creation tool within the actual document. So there's now a 10 step process and it's the same 10 step process that I have used for hundreds of play tests that I have led through, possibly thousands of characters have been created using this 10 step system. And it really literally puts it 10 steps in order that you as the brand new, you've never played DC 20, you're the new game master, you have no idea what's going on. It literally walks you through step by step and you can create a character after these 10 steps. And some of these steps are as quick as 
figure out your health. Here's the formula. Next step. And you keep going. It's super simple, super streamlined, and it's exactly what I've been using. I have polished it off for you guys. Now for the classes, the classes that already existed before the three brand new classes. Uh, I'm going to go into full thing of what each of the changes were in the video down in the description on the DC20 official channel. Because uh, again, longer videos, I can just do and make whatever I want on those. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a, the, the, the bigger changes. Monk's stamina got changed <laughs> again. Their first stamina the version was very bad, understandably so. Uh, it was flavorful, but bad. The second version was unique and different and very monk-like, but it had some weird interactions with the game and it, com it contradicted some things with their second level feature and created more restrictions to design space than openness. So the new version now, I'm gonna read it to you right here. You can gain one stamina point if you do any of the following. Once per round, so again, the spirit of the monk is yin and yang, right? Offense and defense, push and pull, all that kind of stuff, right? So you have two different ways to gain stamina. Once per round, you hit a target with an unarmed strike, Interesting, you can regain stamina. Or once per round, you're missed by an attack uh, against you. So there's two different ways, one defensive, one offensive, that you could regain stamina. So super interesting now for the monk. I think it's in a much better spot now. Also in the turtle stance, you can move now. It's, it's You're not immobile in the turtle stance. You can move. It's only one space. It's literally capped at one space, but you can move. Because yes, I know, turtles can move. Okay. Paladins, I'm sorry, paladins. There has been a mana nerf to the paladins. If you did not realize, Paladins are a hybrid, uh, the only hybrid class in the game. Uh, the original version of the Warlock, yes, was going to be a hybrid class, but then uh, we added stamina into it, and then uh, it, the long story on the Warlock, it does not, it is not better with stamina. Uh, there's some interesting things have as far as health and stamina is concerned, but then with a spellcaster with stamina also got weird. So anyway, Paladin's a hybrid. It's a two-thirds martial and a one-third spellcaster. But the problem was, is it had two thirds of martial and also two thirds of spellcaster, giving it a lot of mana. And if you if you did things right in the build, you could actually get the same amount of mana as a cleric in some multi-class. So no, 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 no. So the paladin is gonna be fine, especially hybrid classes. We're, we're really making sure to watch out for hybrid classes not getting too strong. And the paladin being the, the, the one right now, this is the adjustment. So you only gain one mana every level instead of two mana every level. So it's more of a scaling thing. And you still have your prime, you still have all your stuff, so you're still okay, but your scaling of mana is a little bit slower. Scion got some updates of more so of clarification of their telekinesis feature and was just more clear as to how each part is. There's now sections that show each different section of how it works and it's super, super clear. Rangers now, uh, they all have a little bit of limitations to how much stamina they can get back from their Hunter's Mark. Their Hunter's Mark was a bit strong in that they could get infinite stamina back every time they hit and always got advantage, so ooh, it was a lot, okay? Yeah giving the rangers some needed love though. Um, so now you can only regain a stamina once per turn from hitting your target, like once per round, for, you can regain stamina from attacking your hunter's mark and you only gain that advantage for yourself once per hunter's mark, which I know it's two nerfs to the ranger, but they also get a buff because their hunter's mark now plays a little bit more interestingly with their team. So, and this I think is an exciting buff to be able to be a benefit and a boost to your team and allies and really feel like you're, you're contributing to the group. So now, on your Hunter's Mark target, if you get a heavy hit or higher, it used to be a brutal hit or higher, if you get a heavy hit or higher, which I mean, with advantage on it, it's really not gonna be that hard to do, you now grant a help dice to the next atta target that attacks, making that target weaken, exposing them to more further attacks and stuff like that. So I think it's gonna be a nice little balance out there for the Ranger. And of course, the Sorcerer. We might as well say the Sorcerer got reworked or overhauled. Um, it had two main features of overload and spell break. Basically, the, the, the mechanics have been switched in in some ways. Uh, Overload used to deal damage to yourself and you were just damaging yourself as you're casting spells. You gain plus five to your spell checks. You're able to cast spells like crazy, but you'd be hurting yourself and at low levels that's really, really painful and really punishing and ah, and then there's spell break and spell break you gained exhaustion but sometimes you don't care about exhaustion or your if your mana wasn't low and there's too many wild surges so now the new version of sorcerer is much more user friendly it's not as punishing as far as mechanics go and the wild surges don't happen all the time it's a bit more rare and a bit more special when they actually happen so now how overload works is you're still pushing your body to the limit pushing your magic to the limit your body is vibrating with magic and you have to still make checks to try and maintain 
maintain it, still keep control of it. But if you fail, you only gain a level of exhaustion now, which actually is only a minus one on checks. Exhaustion in DC 20 is not as punishing as it is in D&D, so don't get freaked out by that. Um, but that's a much better way now of not like killing yourself literally as far as damage is concerned. It's just for exhaustion. But the DC is a little bit lower. Everything little, feels a little bit better there. Spell break now, whenever you try and cast spells without mana, that's when you damage yourself. That's when you're, you're, you're using your own body to try and cast magic anyway, well, in, kind of like a warlock, but in a, in a different way. Um, but you are casting spells with no mana, potentially hurting yourself. So you're not really using your health like warlocks do to fuel your magic. You are casting magic anyway and, and just hurting yourself in the process. And I've also updated the monster guide. So whenever you have the bundle, if you if you did already have and you've purchased the, the alpha version, uh, in that bundle, there's a monster homebrew guide that is now also updated as well. There's a little bit of things I added there as far as health goes and some of the, some of the attribute overhauls and some of the other things and also just even more experience now in the in the couple of months it's been now for me playing even more games play, running a campaign of it now all that stuff I just added a little bit more tips and tricks in there specifically revolving around health and some other little updates there too so there you go check out all the stuff there's the other channel that's gonna be pumping out more videos on DC 20 even longer ones to kind of get really up to date and fully immerse yourself as much as you want to uh, the Kickstarter is also linked down in the description as well to kind of get ready for that because that's coming th less than three months away uh, lots of really really big things going on here y'all and I'm so excited uh, that y'all are excited honestly and I just really appreciate anyone who has been a part of this in any way shape or form from viewers to people in live streams to people in the patrons and all the different feedback from all the different parts of this thing it's been absolutely amazing I'm blown away and thank you so much let's keep staying creative thinking outside the box peace